once again, I want to welcome all of you this morning for another blessed time in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Before we preach, I'm sure you've been made aware, tomorrow we are starting week three of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I believe that it's been great. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I want to read Daniel 10, 2-3. The Bible says, In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth nor did I anoint myself at all. Three whole weeks were fulfilled. Brothers and sisters, two full weeks have been completed. But we are not done. Daniel says, our moon, morning here is another word for fasting. So we can say, I was mourning or I was fasting three full, say with me, three full weeks. Three, three, three. Not two and a half. Not two. Not one and a half. <laughs> three full weeks. Hallelujah. So we are entering the third full week. Tomorrow. And we will be praying in the chapels every single day from four until uh, six. And from six to seven, we're going to have our seven, just the way we did in the first week. Praise the Lord. So make sure you are there every single day. This is the last week. Hallelujah. There is no, there is no excuse. You have to, if you haven't joined the fast, join in now. This is still, you still have a chance. The Bible says even those that came at the 11th hour, they were still rewarded. So some of you will be like the 11th hour type of fasters, but you will still be rewarded by the grace of the Lord. Hallelujah. So make sure you join. Now, you see, this is very important. You know, I want to read for you Hosea chapter 6 verse 2. The Bible says, after two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. You see, there are things God does in the first two days. But the third day, even his son was raised on the third day. So the Bible says, after two days, he will revive us. Now, I don't know about you, but I really feel revived. I mean, from where I'm coming from, uh, in 2021, all those lockdowns, all the problems, I feel the Holy Ghost is reviving me. Yeah. Hallelujah. And anybody that has joined this fast from the 10th, I'm sure you will testify that certain things have been revived in your spirit. If nothing has been revived, it could be that you are not fasting properly. Or you haven't been fasting and praying at the same time. Or you've been fasting and watching TV, doing a whole lot of other things that did not allow the revival to take place. But if you've done it properly, the Bible says, after two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, so I can say after two weeks, he will revive us. And on the third week, he will raise us up. I see God raising some of you up in the name of Jesus Christ. Anything that has kept you down, anything that has caused you to be bended down, as we enter this third week, trust God for a lifting up. Trust God for a raising up. Trust God for a lifting up. In the name of Jesus. By his mighty power, he will do it. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe the word of God. You see, you have to learn to be a people of the word. Dreams will be raised up. Ministries will be raised up. Gifts that were dying will be raised up. Marriages that were being sung down will be raised up. Things that were falling apart. Finances that were drowning will be raised up. Hallelujah. Anything that Satan was busy with to take you down. The Bible says on the third day, on the third week, he will raise us up. That is your expectation for this last week. God is raising me up. God is raising me up. God is raising me up. Something is raising up. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Please take your seat in the presence of the Lord. 
That is our expectation. Please don't miss this last week. It's three full weeks. The same way Daniel did it. Don't do two weeks and then you are now out. Three full weeks. And on the last week, he will raise us up. Praise the Lord. Well, this morning we're going to continue with the series that we are on at the moment. Neutralizing Curses Part 3. Hallelujah. Seven signs that a curse is working against you. Seven signs that something is busy destroying things in your life. Number one, emotional breakdown. You are constantly down. You can never be happy for a week. Constantly depressed. Constantly having negative thoughts. Your moods are always dark. And I also want to include here madness. Do you understand this? People just getting mad in the family, ending up in mental institutes, or even ending up on the streets bare naked like Adam and Eve. Do, such things is a sign a curse is working in the family. Number two, chronic diseases that are operating in the family. Something your great, great, great mother had, your mother had, now you are having, and you can see coming on your child, it's not a coincidence. A chronic and hereditary disease is usually a sign, a curse is activated. Circumstances that keep repeating themselves over every family member. These are chronic things. But I want to really focus just on the health. The health. Things you, something is happening to you but you've seen it in the family before with somebody else. Number three, miscarriages. And here I'm including things like fibroids, an ability to conceive, impotence, gynecological problems, female problems, constantly having menstruation, other heavy, severe menstruation pains, or the blood doesn't come, or it's coming too much. Or it, I mean, it's, you are always having a problem in the female issues. Repeated rapes. Incest. There is a curse working. Sign number four. Marriage breakdown. Here I mean relationship problems. There's never peace. Either there's no marriage or there are very difficult marriages. Or the marriages don't last. Hmm? Marital problems. Relationships don't work. Nobody is married. People are just living there and there. Or when they are married, they are never happy. It's difficult. The man is cheating. The woman is cheating. There are problems. Always meetings. Always court cases. Oh, the marriage doesn't last. They get married, the man dies. The woman dies. This happened, that happened. The marriage is, is never nice. 
Six, being prompt to accidents. You are constantly involved in car accidents, bike accidents, falling down. You are walking from here to here. You sleep, you fall. You, you are carrying glasses, one fall. Hey, or constantly something, your phone breaks, your iPad breaks, your, your, your laptop gets stolen, your clothes are on the line outside, three are missing. Th things are constantly just not in place. You walking, a, a, a brand just come out of nowhere, come and hit you. Or you are just waiting for, for the taxi and then a bike comes from nowhere and hits you. Or a bird just flying, come and flies on you. Like just, it's like everything seems to be against your presence. Hmm? Seven. A history of suicide. Constant suicidal thoughts. Constant. Constant. And in your family, there are a lot of unnatural and unexplainable deaths. People die by stabbing. People are killed by shooting. People are killed by poisoning. Do you understand? People are killed a lot in car accidents. And, or many people die in a short period of time. Or people die of very simple diseases that don't kill other people. It's a sign. Something is working. Now, if one of these things is present, it might not necessarily be a curse. If two or three that I've mentioned here are present. In fact, last week I told you, don't ask, is there a case? There is. You understand? So it's not like maybe, maybe, no, no, no. Look, there is. Or there are. I'm just giving you signs now to help you. Maybe Because some of you, you are still having that argument in your heart. I don't think there are cases in my family. Now, let's work with these seven signs. Now, these are not my signs. This is one of, you know, I've just amplified them, you know, but this is actually from a great man of God who has gone to be with the Lord years and years ago. I listened to him preach and he gave these signs and I was baffled. His name was Derek Prince. When, when, when he gave these signs, I look, and almost every one of them was present in my life. And I started a work to neutralize. Hallelujah. The curses. You too, by God's grace, will neutralize Every case that is fighting your life, fighting your progress, causing all kinds of confusion, repeated cycles, you are unable to break forth. You are unable to conceive. You are unable to see fruits. You shall break forth in the name of Jesus. I give you praise. 2022 is our year of bearing much fruit according to the word of the Lord. In the book of John 15 verse 8, God is clear. God is not confused. God has made his intentions very clear to you and to myself that he wants you to bear not little, much fruit. In John 10, 10, same chapter, I mean, a, a, another chapter, he's telling them, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. David says that you anoint my head, my cup overflows. He told Adam, fill the earth. I mean, this is an extravagant God. He's not limiting you. Whatever is limiting you by the Spirit of God, let it be cursed now. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, you must understand something. Not bearing fruit is a very spiritual thing. That's why I, I told you I could have started this series anywhere else. There are so many subjects on this series. But I decided by the Spirit of God, let's start at the root. Let's lay the axe at the root of the tree. Do you understand? Because if you cannot deal with the curse issue, you are just wasting your time. 
You are just wasting your time. And I'm praying that you will understand the importance of this. I keep telling you the same thing. Because sometimes you think the problem is elsewhere. You see. And I'm saying now that not bearing fruit is a very spiritual thing. When you don't see a good character coming out of a person, when you don't see results out of a person, when you don't see ministry progress in a person, I'm telling you now that that thing is very spiritual. Mark 11 verse 12 to 14, the Bible says, Now the next day, when they had come out of Bethany, he was hungry. That was Jesus. And seeing from afar a tree, a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And the disciples heard it. Let's jump to verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. The fig tree which you cursed Brothers and sisters, people don't just wither away. Businesses don't just wither away. Ministries don't just wither away. Finances don't just wither away. Joy and happiness doesn't just wither away. No, 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 no. There, you see, Peter used the word, they treat you cursed. He said, when Jesus was speaking, Jesus didn't say, I curse you in the name of Jesus. He just said, let no man eat fruit from you ever again. A simple, and then he said it, he said it in passing. The next day, everything had changed for that tree. Everything had changed for that tree. It had withered to the root. By God's grace, anything that is withering or that has withered, that was not supposed to wither. This morning, by the grace of God, let the power of the Most High neutralize those curses from your life. As you can see, this fig tree's condition was totally changed because of a curse. Because of a curse. That did not sound like a curse when it was said. How many of us go around that day and people make statements to you that are similar to this type of a statement? And you just brush it off thinking it's nothing. And to your, to your amazement, things start withering in and around you. Things start withering in and around you. That process is going to change this morning in the name of Jesus. How can you neutralize curses? How can you cause things to stop withering? Because a curse has a withering effect with it. A withering effect. Next week, by God's grace, as I close this, I'll be also now taking you to the origins of curses. Where do they come from? So far, if you haven't, please take time and listen to these messages on, on CastBox. They are also on YouTube. The first day I took you through the salt of salvation. Last week I took you through the salt of light, the salt of the anointing, the salt of the prayer of the blessing. All these are arsenals. You need to start surrounding yourself, except you are joking. But the cases are not joking. They want to wither you. Uh, they want to wither everything in around you. So if you are joking, joke. But if you are not a joker, 
then this is what you should engage. These tools that you see me giving you. Many people can see the effect of curses, but they do not know what to do to neutralize them. They can see how things are falling apart, but they do not know what to engage to block and stop the withering from continuing. You are being given the tools. And I keep telling you, you say you are a tree. The first I told you are a city. The Bible is clear that you are also a tree. The righteous are like a tree planted in the house of God. So as a tree, you can wither. A curse can be spoken against you being a tree. And that curse causes you to wither to the root. And that curse causes you to lose your leaves, to lose your fruit. And to become just take good for the fire. Let's continue this morning with more salt that I keep throwing into this thing to stop the withering from continuing. You see, when you want to stop something, if you throw a little, you might not break it enough. So you need to throw more and I keep giving you more salt to pour in so that we can finally neutralize these cases. Some of them are ancient cases that have been in your family for years and years and years. You are not coming to say you want to stop things. They are saying, no, we have a covenant. Things have been written down. Things have been placed there. You cannot come and change. You say, no, no, no I'm going to change it. Then you've, enjoyed, you, you've, you've managed to involve the curse of salvation, the curse of light, the curse of the anointing. I mean the salt, the salt of salvation, the salt of light, the salt of the anointing, the salt of prayer. And you can see, it seems like there's hope, but it's still not okay. Okay, don't get worried. Let's get more salt inside the pot. Let's get more salt inside the pot. This morning, number five, the salt of positive confession. You know, it takes a curse, it takes a negative confession to activate a curse. Just like you've seen now. Jesus pronounced a negative confession and a curse was activated over a tree. So how do you neutralize some of these curses? You neutralize them with Positive confession. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, the Bible says, I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Question, how do you choose? I can see curses are working against me and I'm choosing the blessing, but how do I choose it? And because it's not enough to say I'm choosing the blessing. How do I actually effect the blessing? The same way, a curse is put in effect with words. A blessing is also put in effect with words. The Bible says, God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply. Blessings are activated with words. Curses are also activated with words. How do I choose the blessing? I choose the blessing with the words I choose to speak. Proverbs 18 verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. death and life. I place the four life and death. Death and life. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Romans 4 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So you see, this is how God brings life from death. He calls it. He calls. He calls those things that be not as though they were. Don't use your mouth to cry. Use your mouth to decree. Don't use your mouth to cry. Hey, nothing is working. Hey, don't you, you are using your mouth for wrong things. Use your mouth to create. Use your mouth to decree what must start happening in your family, in your finances, in your life. Use your mouth. Use your mouth. Number six, the salt of tithing. This is another wonderful and powerful. You see, as you keep, it's, it's impossible to be adding all these salts I'm giving you and then the, 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 the food does not become salty. Yeah. 
Some of you, your salt is dull. That's what curses do. Curses make things dull. There's no life in them. You know, salt brings life. It, it, brings, it brings seasoning. It brings a taste to things. And your life is currently tasteless. But let me tell you something. As we keep adding the salt of this, the salt of this, the salt of this, the salt of this, your life is going to be tasty. In the name of Jesus. Don't just tell your neighbor, just keep, just keep adding a bit of salt. Keep adding a bit of salt. And that thing is going to start becoming nice. I'm telling you, people are going to like, start enjoying the, the food. People are going to start enjoying your life. Your life is going to become attractive. Your life is going to become tasty. The salt of tithing. It's a salt. It's a salt. You throw it in there. Malachi 3 verse 8 to 9, 11. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. I wish it ended there. But look at the very next verse. You are cursed. With a curse. We are trying to run away from curses. Everywhere you find a curse, try to know the cause. People who rob God in tithes and offerings, the Bible says, you are cursed with a curse. I think that's the only place in the Bible where a curse is repeated twice. Even Genesis, he, was not, he didn't say, you are cursed with a curse. He even cursed the ground. But now when it comes to Malachi, he's not cursing your finances. He's not cursing your work. He's, not, he's cursing. He says, you, you, you are cursed. To Adam, he says, the ground is cursed. But when you take his tithe, he says, you are cursed. He says, this is why he says you are cursed. He says, you have robbed me. He said to Adam, he said, if you eat, you will die. It's not, it's not me that will suffer. You, you will suffer. You, you will die. But here, you say, you, you, this, this is personal. This one now is a personal matter. You have taken something that belongs to me. You have taken something that belongs to me. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. He means even your whole family. Nation is your people, people connected to you. Now that's why you see the struggle seems to never end. Every week you, you, you multiply the curse. Every month you are just adding more and more and more and more and more and more. Who can fight God and win? But I love my God. He always has a way out for you. He always has a solution for you. He doesn't make it the end. He says, now, bring all the tithes. He's not giving you a way out. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. He said, this is how you neutralize this one. Bring the tithe. Bring it. Tell your neighbor, bring the tithe. Bring the tithe. Bring the tithe. Stop squeezing it. Stop calculating with God's money. I have never sat in my house making plans on Bill Gates' money. I know it's not my money. I can never access it. Ask your neighbor, why are you making plans with another person's money? Bring the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you, you see, the same you that was cursed. Now, he said, You, not for everybody, you. God is fair. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out, you see, He's an, an extravagant God, abundance God. You bring your little tithe, he's pouring out on you. Pour 
had such a blessing that you will not, there will not be room enough to receive it. Oh Lord, please pour, 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 pour. This is enough. This is enough to embarrass certain cases in your life. This particular one here is enough to destroy the power of certain cases. This one. Where else have you ever seen a scripture like this? But this is where it gets interesting. Look at this. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. So that he will not destroy. Look at it, it's coming. The fruit of your ground. You see now? It boils down to your fruit again. I will not destroy the fruit. The fruit. The fruit. So you see, some people, it's not that they don't bear fruit. They do, but it gets destroyed. They produce, it gets destroyed. They produce, and God says, I take personal responsibility. When you don't pay your tithe, I decide myself, I will destroy the fruit. So that I will not destroy the fruit of your ground. And look at it. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field. And this is a year of bearing much fruit. And it says that your vine will not fail. Receive that promise in the name of Jesus. Your vine, say with me, my vine will not fail to bear fruit in the name of Jesus. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. When it's time for the fruit to come, it will come. It will never fail to come when it's supposed to come. When it is time for the fruit to come, it must come. My vine will not fail to bear fruit. Why? I pay my tithe. I bring my tithe. I bring my offerings. This is how we neutralize cases, brothers and sisters. Not just with singing songs. and You see, some of these cases, he didn't say pray. You understand? Prayer will not work here. That's why I'm giving you different salt to engage. Number seven, the salt of serving God. It's a salt. It's a salt. You have hit, you have added the salt of tithing and you have also added the salt of positive confession and one of the positive words is that I'm going to bear much fruit this year in the name of Jesus Christ. My finances are increasing. That you must learn to speak life over yourself. Don't sit there and cry. Prophesy what you want to see happen. He says, son of man, can these bones live? Prophesy to the dry bones. Let Jesus says, whoever shall say to this mountain, get down, remove, and be thrown in the sea, and does not doubt, he shall have whatever he says. Please stop closing your mouth. Start speaking. Start speaking. Start speaking. Start speaking. Start declaring. When somebody says something negative to you, cancel it immediately. Tell him, I reject that statement. I have nothing to do with that. I'm blessed. I am a blessing. And when you say negative statement about yourself, because the Bible says, by your words, you shall be condemned. And by your words, you shall be justified. So sometimes, we curse ourselves. And a lot of young people curse themselves through the music they listen and they sing along. You're cursing yourselves with those curse words that you are saying over yourself. All those things that we say against ourselves, things Satan makes you think about and finally he makes you say. When you have found yourself, maybe you just said something negative against yourself or against your child. Please, change it immediately. Cancel the statement. Say, in the name of Jesus, I cancel what I just said. I am not cursed. I am blessed. I am not ugly. I am beautiful. I am not a lazy person. I am a hardworking person. 
Learn to cancel negative confessions with positive confessions. We were raised in this world. So the chances are you were trained to speak negative. You were trained to speak negative over your life against other people. We are always negative most of the time. It takes time to adjust your mind to positivity and to faith. So in that process, you might still have those, if, we can, if you can allow me to, those slips of the time. But correct them. Correct them immediately. Once the Holy Ghost says, hey, remember what you just said. Holy Ghost, I'm sorry, I repent. I cancel that confession. I change it with this one. Don't just think it. Say it. Say it. Say it. You shall have whatever you say. Then the, 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 the salt of tithing. Oh, learn to put aside what belongs to God. And don't bring your tithe with depression and anger and, and, and all kinds. No, please, if that is the case, don't just keep it for yourself. Because it will not work. You are bringing your tithe with a lot of regrets. You know, this man, I could have bought this. You know, I could have done this. If this man, I don't know. Ish, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I could have done this. I could have done that. Rather just keep it. Rather just keep it. My Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. I am blessed to pay my tithe. It's a privilege to give back to God what belongs to God. Then the blessing is released. Number three, the sort of saving God. Exodus 23 verse 25. So you shall serve the Lord your God and he will bless your bread and your water. You see those two things? That's where your life is. Bread and water. That is where your life is. If the blessing of God is not on those things, it curses, it curses at work. Even though you have bread, the Bible calls it the bread of sorrow. If you have water, the Bible calls it bitter water. The waters of Mara. Bitter waters. Only a blessing can turn a bread of sorrow into a bread of joy. And bitter waters to sweet streams of waters. So some people do have bread and they do have water. But they don't enjoy it much. It's a lot of sorrow. I don't know whether you've ever worked so hard you get home, you don't even have it strength to eat. It has happened to me a couple of times. I do work so hard. When you get home, even to eat, you don't have the strength. Now imagine you've worked so hard and you finally build this wonderful house, but you never get a chance to even enjoy it. The time you're supposed to enter the house, you're entering the hospital. The bread of sorrow. The bread of sorrow. I heard of a man who built a very, very big, nice house. Completed the house. The day he came to inspect the house with the contractor, the contractor showing him around, you know, and he's enjoying seeing everything he's seeing. Then they go on top and he's standing at the balcony looking at the big view that he's got. Out of nowhere, he sleep and falls from up, down, knock his head, dies. I'm saying he came to inspect the house. Like that was, the house was done and he's done not just inspecting the house. Goes up on the balcony, sleep from the balcony, somehow falls down and dies. It is a blessing from God that will allow you to enjoy the works of your hands. It is the blessing of the Lord. For you to have children and enjoy them is the blessing of the Lord. For you to cook food and actually get to eat that food and enjoy it is the blessing of the Lord. For you to buy a TV and get to watch it. Many of you buy TV, you can't watch it. You pay for DSTV, but you never watch it. Oh, oh. You buy food, but you're never there to eat it. You rent the house, but you're never there to enjoy it. 
You spend your whole day out. You just come in the night to sleep and you leave again early in the morning. But you are paying rent. The bread of sorrow. The bread of sorrow. The Bible says you shall serve the Lord your God. He shall bless your bread. May God start blessing your bread. May God start blessing your water. That's what we need. It's not enough to have bread. The bread must be blessed. Now once you won't enjoy it, I promise you. You'll be surprised. If you check your movements, you say you are working so hard, but you can't enjoy. And the key to breaking this curse is to serve God. Serve God. Those of you that are too dignified, you can't serve God. You are too busy. Continue. Who is he? Who is he? But the wise will serve God. Get involved in God's work. I'm telling you, don't be too busy to serve God. You will regret it. You will regret it. Very, very, very desperately. So I'm encouraging you this morning. Let's, this is the year of bearing much fruit. Everybody get involved in soul winning. Get involved in inviting people to church. This, the Bible says that I will build my church. God, Jesus is not busy with any other project on earth. The only project Jesus is busy with is building the church. Now, if you are busy with every project except that project, you are wasting your money. You better get involved with what God is involved with. If you want to see his hand on your life. Otherwise, it's the bread of sorrow. It's the bread of sorrow. It's a car you pay for every month. But the only distance it takes you is from your house to work. Work to the house. House to work. Work to the house. That's all. When you are off, you are too tired to enjoy it. You sleep. The bread of sorrow. It is his hand that comes and touches you like this a little bit. As you are saving him. Decide that this car will not be for work, house, house, work. This car will be for the glory of God. I will use it for God's glory. I will use everything that I have. And that is how God is. Oh, you are serving me. Okay, let me bless your bread. And before you realize, you will see something that you are not supposed to see. Praise God. Last one for today. The salt of believing in your prophet. Is a salt. Believing in your prophet. Hallelujah. Amen. Hosea chapter 12 verse 13. Amen. By a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. You see, when you read that verse at first sight, you don't understand what that means. Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world at this time. Number one in military. Number one in anything you can think or imagine. That was Egypt. For you to say that Egypt has somebody or a group of people working for them to make sure that their wealth continues increasing. For you to say that you are coming to take those people. I'm sure you realize that you should know your story very well. Because you are not dealing with just anybody. You are dealing with the greatest nation on earth at that time. That would be like your America of today. But look at what God used to deliver an entire nation out of the hand of a strong nation. A prophet. A man without weapons. A man without a horse, a man without a chariot, a man without a, a, a knife, a sword, a man without a spear, a, an arrow, a bow. All he has is a rod. He enters a nation 
that is strong with military, that is strong with strategy, that is strong with all kinds of witchcraft, he enters that nation with one rod. And by the time he's done, three million people are leaving the nation. The nation that was strong is on its knees. Everybody is crying with one rod. No horse, no chariot, one rod. By a prophet. God is able to pull you out of any captivity that you are finding yourself right now by a prophet. By a prophet. By a prophet. By a prophet. God never sent angels except to execute the orders of the prophet. By a prophet. By a prophet. You will be out. <laughs> All these cases, they are surrounding you just like Egypt. You see, Egypt was surrounding Israel. You go to the left, is Egypt. You go to the right, is Egypt. Behind is Egypt. In front is Egypt. And that is what a curse is. A curse is something that surrounds you. You go to Paris, it's there. You go to Japan, it's waiting. Everywhere you go, the curse is there. Wherever you go, the Bible says, curse shall you be when you go out and when you come in. Like you are surrounded. And Egypt was, sur was surrounding Israel. But by a prophet. A man of God just enters with a rod. That's all. A small rod in his hand. And David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want your rod and your staff. They comfort me. Every shepherd has a rod. Every shepherd has a staff. And that is the instrument they use to remove the sheep out of any difficulty the sheep might find himself into. By a prophet. This is one of the most efficient salt that God has. When the rest has failed, this one must work. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He says, I will give you shepherds according to my heart. Jeremiah 3 verse 15. Who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Can I tell you something? Almost every case can be neutralized with knowledge and understanding. <laughs> Look at the case of Childbirth pains. God told man, a woman, he told the woman, you will give birth with a lot of pain. Isn't it? Okay. Today, we have neutralized that case with knowledge and understanding. We inject you something small. You give birth while eating banana. You give birth while updating your Facebook status. Say with me, knowledge and understanding. That's the cure of curses. God told us, in the sweat of your brow, you shall cultivate the ground. Today, you get a tractor, you put on the field, you press a button, and the tractor starts sweating for you. Knowledge and understanding. Knowledge and understanding. Even the snake has exempted itself from the curse. God, look, God did not ask an angel. To, God Himself cursed the snake. He cursed the snake violently. No other animal has been cursed the way the snake has been cursed. But Jesus, God Himself, appears in the gospel and He says to you, "Be wise." Be wise as a, sin, as a snake. He, he has come back and is telling to you that the snake has managed to make its way. Yay! 
The snake cannot, doesn't have legs, but the snakes go up the trees. The snake doesn't have wings, but the snake can fly. The snake doesn't have hands, but the snake can eat. Like, there's nothing the snake cannot do. How did the snake overcome his handicaps? Wisdom. So much wisdom that even Jesus himself recommended. He recommended him to us. He said, I look, if you want to, if you want to see a person that has overcome curses, that I myself have cursed him, that he has overcome, learn from him. The snake. The snake. And the job of a shepherd, when a shepherd, when a real shepherd enters your life, is not just to fall down. Because some of you, when you hear the last cases, you are already seeing yourself flying in the air. With, with, with one touch, you are flying to the north. One touch, you are flying to the south. There is a place for that. But let me tell you, the greatest power is when knowledge and understanding is entering you. That one is the greatest power. Every case that you see, most of these diseases were curses. I mean, like leprosy. That was a curse disease. Today, with knowledge and understanding, we've neutralized the thing. Oh, yes. That's why God says, my people are destroyed. They don't know. Curses continue working. When you don't know much. Just growing in knowledge and understanding will give you an upper hand over so many cases. So many cases will not work. You know, a couple of days ago, I was watching TV and I saw a young boy that was having fits of epilepsy. And his were not, you know, normally you, a person will have them like maybe once every few months. This guy was having them four times a day. Four times, five times a day. You know what they did? The parents did. The parents took him to a hospital. The doctor diagnosed him. And the doctor said, no, there's something in the brain. There's a, there's, there's a, there's a strange object in the brain that is causing the current of electricity. The young, the young man went for the surgery. I was watching it live. The cut, the head, went through the brain use a certain tool and got that piece of thing. I don't know what it was. They pull it out and put it inside the glass. And I was thinking, I said to myself, you know, if this type of thing was going on here, I was going to be using anointing oil. I was going to be screaming every time the feast that I was going to cast demons. I was going to do a lot. And there is a place for it. There is a place for it. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying, <laughs> just on the other side, there are no more fears of epilepsy because of knowledge and understanding. That is one of the greatest jobs a shepherd comes with you. A prophet. The prophet God gave them. He gave them Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Five books. Knowledge. Understanding. This is a prophet too, but he, he, the only prophecy he ever gave them was that God will send another prophet like me. Talking about Jesus. Everything else, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Right where you are now, just begin to pray and say to the Lord, Father, help me receive wisdom, knowledge, and understanding from the prophet you have given me. Everybody, everywhere, begin to pray that prayer right now. Father, help me start tapping into knowledge and understanding.
The Bible says in all you're getting, get understanding. Get understanding. Get understanding. Get understanding. Oh yes. Father, help me go for knowledge. Help me work with the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel. I reject every stupidity. I reject every stupidity from my life. Oh yes, oh yes, in Jesus precious name, we are still talking about the salt of receiving your prophet. Sit down. Now, Acts chapter 10 verse 44, the Bible says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. Hallelujah. You see, one way through which your prophet is going to help you neutralize cases is by you listening to the words of your prophet. The Bible says here that while Peter was yet speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on those who were hearing him. And we know that the Holy Ghost is the power of God. I taught you about it last week. That's the anointing. So the anointing of God fell on people as they were listening to the word. This is how your prophet helps you break through the cases. As you listen to your prophet in cast box, as you go to cast box by yourself and you start listening, just the same thing that happened here, the anointing will fall. And curses start breaking. Jesus speaking said, The Spirit of the Lord is for He has anointed me to preach. He has anointed me to proclaim deliverance to the captives. As the preaching is going on, there is an anointing on it for deliverance. As you keep listening, that anointing will fall on you. And that is how your freedom will come. Three things you should do with your prophet. Number one, receive your prophet. This is very important. For the gift of a prophet to work in your life, you have to first and foremost receive your prophet. Matthew chapter 10 verse 41. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Do you believe God blesses and rewards you just for receiving somebody he has sent to you? Like not even for anything, just the fact that you have received the person God sent, he rewards you. Why? Simple. Your prophet is a man. I mean to say he's a human being. When you see your prophet, you will see deficiencies. When you see your prophet, you will see things that are not okay. When you see your prophet, you will see things that don't look the way you thought they were supposed to look. There will be a lot of things about your prophet that might not be in tune with what you think a prophet should be. That's why it's difficult to receive a prophet. And that's why God rewards you for receiving. Because Receiving means, I have seen this, I have seen this, and I have seen this, but I've gone beyond that to see the man of God, to see the woman of God. So receiving your prophet already in itself is an act of faith. It's a great act of faith that God cannot 
than look or look down on. He has to reward it. Receive a prophet. John 1, 11 to 12. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. He came to the people he was sent to. But they did not receive him. They say you are the son of the carpenter. I mean, just last week, I did a coffin by your place. Three weeks ago, my neighbor did a bed. And I think you are the one who did a cupboard of uh, my neighbor on the other side. What are you talking about? You are the Messiah. Messiah from where? They did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become. You see, you cannot become until you receive. You can be at ABC for years and never become nothing because you have not received what God has sent. The proof that you have received what God has sent is that you become something. And in this church, we become servants of God. We become blessed. We become prosperous. We become married. We become a lot of things in this church. And those things start happening when you receive a prophet. Mark 6, 4 to 5, Jesus speaking, said, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country among his own relatives and in his own house. In his own house, among his relatives. I've never tried to some degree to reach some of my relatives. I've tried some, some I don't even try because they, I think they, I'll get a curse, not a blessing if I go there. Now he could do there no mighty work because he was not received. Except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. You neutralize, instead of the prophet neutralizing your cases, you rather neutralize the anointing of the prophet when you fail to receive him. You neutralize his anointing. Some of you watching me this morning and listening to me, I don't think I can neutralize the curses or the power of God in me can neutralize the curses that are working against you because you have already neutralized the anointing on my life as far as you are concerned. I'm not a man of God. I'm not a man of God as far as you are concerned. You have seen me eat pap in a small function somewhere and, I, and pap was coming off my, my, my little, like you just saw some stuff. And I'm not a man of God as far as you are concerned. I'm not on TV. I'm not on One Gospel. I'm not on TBN. I'm not on Radio Mafisa. I'm not there and there and there. So I'm not a man of God. He could then do no mighty work. You cannot see certain type of power where the prophet has not been received. You cannot see it. And Jesus gave us three places where this phenomena happens. Phenomenon. Number one, your countrymen, your, what is it here? Your country, your relatives, and your house. People who live with you in the same house. They don't believe you easily. It's a mission for your anointing to work on them. You'll be surprised when you go out, people are blessed. When you come in, you are depressed. When you go out, you are blessed and people are blessed. When you come in, you are depressed and the people are also depressed. You are making people rich out there, but in your own house, people are dying of poverty and hunger. And you are not at fault. 
they don't receive you. As far as they are concerned, you are just the wife or the husband or the brother or the sister. You are just somebody in the house. When you come home, please go remove your clothes. Remove that your suit and start get busy here. I don't know who you think you are. Remove your suit and let's start to cook some rice. Let's start cooking some rice. How on earth will you ever receive and be blessed by such an anointing? Hmm? As far as they are concerned, you are just a houseboy. You are just a house girl. Are you listening to me? Uh -huh. Number two, believe in your prophet. Number one, receive your prophet. Number two, believe in your... You see, believing is another thing. Praise Jesus. Second Chronicles 20.20 So they arose early in the morning and went out in the wilderness of Tekoa as they were out. Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. You shall be established. Believe his prophets. You shall prosper. You shall prosper. You shall prosper. Ezra 16 verse 14. So the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet. They prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet. And Jehoshaphat says to them, believe in his prophet, you will prosper. And the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying. Of her guide, the prophet. You ask me what connection is there between speaking the word and people pro prospering? I don't know. And I just know when they believe what their prophet is saying to them, something starts happening to them. That is just how I know it. That is how it is. When they start believing what he's saying, and the proof that you believe is what you do, what you do, what you do. Then prosperity starts. Lastly, honor your prophet. Number one, receive your prophet. Number two, believe in your prophet. Number three, honor your prophet. Second, first Samuel chapter 9, verse 6 to 8. And when they had come to the land of Zuk, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father ceases caring about the donkeys and become weary about us. And he said to him, Look now, there is in this city a man of God and he is a honorable man. Remember, honor your prophet. All that he says surely comes to pass. So let us go there. Perhaps... He can show us the way that we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But look, if we go, what shall we bring to the man? For the bread in our vessels is all gone, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What shall we, what do we have? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Look, I have here at hand one-fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give that to the man of God to tell us our way. Praise the name of Jesus. You see, that is an interesting story. Saul had lost the three donkeys. He went to look for the donkeys. As he went to look for the donkeys, he got lost himself. Now he's trying to go back home. You see, then the servant he was with says to him, look, let us not just go like this. I hear that there is a prophet here. Why don't we go to him and he will show us what to do? Now Saul says, look, you are right, but we have nothing to go give to him. Everything we had is finished. 
But the servant says, look, I have a little piece of money here. Let's take it with. And we give it to him. And he would take, Do you know that that particular action of going to Samuel is what made Saul a king? After they agreed here, and they now went to the man of God, and the man of God, that's Samuel. And when they went to Samuel, Samuel said, oh, come, I've been expecting you. And that's how Saul gets anointed king over the holy country of Israel. Per adventure. Per adventure. Not something he even planned. But he went with the little they had to honor the man of God. And the entire life of Saul was changed because the man of God poured some oil on his head. He became king just the way the man of God said he would. Something nobody in his family could have done for him. And his whole family became a royal family from that day. Any case that was working against them because Saul himself says he is the least. He was also the, just like Gideon, he was the least. He became the first. God reminded him when he became clever. God said, when you were small in your own eyes, I made you king. You were nothing. He was a demoted person. But when he was going to see the man of God, he didn't go empty-handed. And he returned. He went as a servant, he returned as a king. You see, let me tell you something. The day you learn these keys that are in the Bible, you will start seeing what these people experience in your personal life. All these casualties that we go around with, you are casual. Everything is casual. You have no respect, no honor. You see, and that, that is the reason why nothing flows. Nothing flows. Nothing can flow. Nothing can flow. You are seeing your man of God is just a pastor that preaches for me on Sunday. And then what can flow from there? God is not stupid. Because you don't show honor, he also withholds his goods. Until the right person comes, that will descend. Then he will release it. Look, as I close, I want to tell you something. You've heard Jesus himself say, do not give, throw your pearls to pigs. I want to ask you a question. Somebody who is advising you that don't throw your pearls to pigs, why do you think he will throw his pearls to you? Like, he is telling you that don't do it. Why do you think when it is his turn to anoint, he will just anoint anybody? If he is already telling you, don't do, the, don't give your best to pigs because they don't value it. Why do you think God will release his best prayer on people who don't value it? Why do you think God will release his best virtue on people who don't value it? The man of God can pray until his tongue becomes blue. God will not do anything. Because God knows this person you are praying for doesn't honor you. He doesn't respect the anointing on your life. So I cannot honor what, what you are talking about there. Brothers and sisters, this is why people will be under a great anointing, but they will wither on a daily basis. In fact, they start criticizing. Can you imagine Miriam and Aaron were under this mighty anointing that brought them out of Egypt. Rather, they started criticizing it. And they with that. Both of them, they with that. This mighty power that was available, they could not enjoy. It is the power that lifted the young man called Joshua to prominence. I mean, if all due respect, Aaron was supposed to take over from Joseph. For, for, I mean, God himself recommended Aaron to Moses. So normally, Aaron was, was going to take over. But he was cleared. A 
as you are trading curses, don't multiply curses with dishonor. Don't, don't, don't like instead of neutralizing, you are rather increasing. So, because some, some people, that's what happened. I mean, Moses the prophet is supposed to bring healing to the land, but rather Miriam came out of there with leprosy. With leprosy. Let's work on our hearts. Let's work on our hearts. Your prophet is sent to be a blessing to you. Receive him. Believe in him. Honor him. Never take him for granted. Even when possibilities and circumstances seem to create that environment, always take your steps away. So you say, I want to protect my reception. I want to protect my reception. I'm sure you've seen people, when they're on the phone, they see that the connection is going, they, they don't stay where the connection is poor. They keep moving until they find a good place. And when you can say that, no, this thing I'm doing here is going to affect my reception from my prophet. Let me shift this side. Let me go this side so that I'm in a place where the reception can continue flowing. I don't want to ever be in a place where the reception is no more there, but I'm still standing there. The connection is broken, but I'm still standing there. It's stupidity. Rather readjust your location. Sometimes you have to go a bit further away. Sometimes you have to come a bit closer. Depending on where the reception will be best for you. So that you are never familiar. And so that you can become what you could become under that ministry. May God help us. Right now, I want you to stand on your feet and I want you to start praying. Ask God to help you to never become familiar with your prophet. Open your mouth and begin to pray that prayer. Koraba shaba de brigaraba so pro koraba garabala garabala. Prezi kate kapra koya pala baraba. Mekemena, mekemena. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Come and pray from the depths of your heart. Pray from the depths of your heart. Pray from the depths of your heart. If you have to repent, do it. If you have to change something, do it. If you have to adjust your mind somewhere, do it. But let it come from the bottom of your heart. Thank you, glorious Jesus. I give you praise. I give you praise, Lord. In the name of Jesus. This morning, as we close, I want to pray for somebody that does not know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. If you've been listening to me in this message, you will notice that the main thing is your salvation. Your salvation. Is Jesus coming into your heart this morning? If you are not born again, you are saying, Pastor, I really want Jesus into my life today. I want to pray for you. I want to help you. You know, there is no future except the one I mentioned earlier, the bread of sorrow. Let Jesus come in. He will bring life. This morning you are saying, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want the curse breaker to enter my life. The Son of God. I'm going to count up to three. If that is you, raise your right hand. I'll pray with you. One, two, three. Raise your right hand. I want Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. I want you to be born again. God bless you. You can take your hands down. I also want to pray this morning for somebody who is saying, Pastor, I'm already born again. But this morning, I just want to recommit. I want to come back home. I've lived a life of dishonor. I didn't receive the gift that God sent me. This morning, I repent. I want to come back home. Like the prodigal son went back to the father. I want to come back home where you planted me. At the count of three, you are saying, Pastor, I want you to commit my life to Jesus. I want to pray with you. One, two, three. Raise your right hand. I want you to commit my life to Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, thank you, Father. Quickly this morning, I want us to pray together. Repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you today. 
Forgive me my sins. Wash me with your blood. I believe you died for me. On the third day you rose again. That I might be justified. Right now, I believe my sins are forgiven. I'm justified by your blood. I'm saved. I'm restored. I'm born again. I am free from the power of sin to serve the living God. Thank you, Jesus, for receiving me. Thank you, Jesus, for restoring me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friend, if you've prayed that prayer, the Son of God has entered your heart. We would like to be in touch with you. Please make sure you contact us in the comments or through Messenger. Just make sure that we are in touch with you. Or if you are staying near where one of our branches are, please make sure you contact us, you be in touch with us. We would like to help you grow in God. Amen. Are you excited? Are you blessed? Well, we have come to the end of this broadcast, but it is not over. Amen. Next week, Sunday, we're going to close this deal on the curses. And I want you to be prepared because it's going to be fire. Amen. So make sure you are there. Make sure you come prepared. Make sure you come ready. But right now, we're just going to share the grace of the Lord in fellowship. Amen. Are you ready? One, two, three, let's go. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever a 2022 my year of bearing much fruit I will first nettle for less I will be more like Jesus I'll do more like Jesus call me blessed call me fruit praise the Lord God bless you see you next Sunday bye bye and we will never settle for less we know there's more that's found in you. Come on, sing it out right now. And we will never settle for less. We know there's more that's found in you. And we will never settle for less. We know there's more that's found in you.